What's up my comic comrades? Christmas is almost here and so is the final installment of the DCEU as we've known it with Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. And as we say hasta la vista to this roller coaster of a universe, we think it's the perfect time to take a big picture look at the rise and fall of the DCEU. Because let's be real here, the DCEU has been polarizing to say the least never quite able to find its stride or a path worth staying on. So today we're going to take a look at its inception and make our way through every single one of its films in order of their release, all the way up to the final film, Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, and give our best overview of what we think went wrong along the way. Also, just a quick podcast update, we will be taking our annual holiday break to spend time with our families, so the final variant podcast of the year will be on December 26th, and it will return on January 15th, 2024 to talk about everything that went down while we were away, including how Aquaman fared at the box office, so make note of that. You're not going to want to miss it. Okay, let's get into the rise and fall of the DCEU. The first installment in the DCEU was The Man of Steel, directed by Zack Snyder. The film was a hit at the box office, being the ninth highest grossing film of 2013, while raking in $670 million worldwide off its estimated $225 million budget. Today, Man of Steel is regarded as one of the best films in the entire DCEU, and for the most part, liked by the fandom. However, at the time of its release, fans were far more polarized about the direction Snyder took things with Superman than the box office results might suggest. Right out the gate, director Zack Snyder established a darker DC universe overall, from the visual tone down to the characters and storytelling style. And that led to one of the most controversial scenes from the DCEU in general, which is the moment Superman kills General Zod. A good chunk of fans didn't like that the Beacon of Hope was forced to kill in his very first movie. Although it's not completely foreign for Superman to kill, as he's killed several times in the comic books and in main continuity at that. But more often than not, he finds a way to avoid the loss of life, which is where the controversy stemmed from. Either way, having Superman snap Zod's neck as he sees no other way to stop him from killing the innocent people in front of him displayed a very new Superman and definitely cemented the tone for the DCEU going forward. It also simultaneously is one of the most defining moments for Superman's growth in this universe. But again, besides the controversy and geekdom, this film overall is now widely considered to be one of the best DCEU films. A lot of people would say the best. It also introduced introduced us to Henry Cavill as Superman, who is arguably the best live-action Superman to date. The movie also brought us the brilliant and now iconic Hans Zimmer flight Superman score. So after the success of Man of Steel and the fantastic job he did with Watchmen years before, Warner Brothers decided to give Zack Snyder the keys to the kingdom and build out the new DC Extended Universe as their main director and creative. And most felt like things were off to a strong start. Unfortunately, this would lead to the next entry into DC's live-action film universe and what became the beginning of the end for the DC. EU. And of course, that is Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice, which debuted three years later in March of 2016. Now, when this was officially teased at San Diego Comic Con in 2013, it pretty much broke the internet. To this day, it remains one of the biggest movie announcements in history as fans lost their mind, us included, over the fact that we were finally going to get both a Batman and Superman together in live action for the first time. It was directed by Zack Snyder and set up as a sequel to Man of Steel. In the anticipation, to see the Man of Steel and the Dark Knight together on the big screen for the very first time was insane. Everyone thought this movie would be monumental for the DC Cinematic Universe and set the stage for DC to compete with or even surpass the MCU's success. For all intents and purposes, Batman v Superman should have been one of the biggest superhero movies of all time. On paper, its arrival should have landed like an Infinity War mega blockbuster, but it did not. And I'll explain why in just a minute. If you've been following Variant for a while, you know we're big Star Wars fans, but I'm also a bit of a Trekkie. With that in mind, however, last month we showed you guys the massive Millennium Falcon model kit from our friends and today's sponsor, Fan Home. Well, feast your eyes on their insane USS Enterprise NCC-1701D from Star Trek The Next Generation. This is another jaw-dropping model kit that is 28 inches long when completed, made of die-cast metal, and like every Fan Home collectible model, is full of unbelievably accurate details, including illuminated windows, light-up engines, a detachable saucer section, and more. One of the many things I love about Fan Home model kits is that while they're heavily detailed and high quality, like this USS Enterprise for instance, they are friendly for both beginner and expert modelers. And yes, when I say models, I mean you get to build them yourself. With every Fan Home subscription kit, each month they send you the next set of assembly stage pieces to continue the build, as well as easy to follow assembly instructions inside a fully illustrated magazine full of behind the scenes material, little known information, and rare images. Each Fan Home model subscription includes bonus gifts as well, like this binder, Star Trek 
Track mug and USS Enterprise t-shirt. But don't just take our word for it, check it out for yourself. Just click the link in the description and while you're on their site, give their other Marvel, Star Wars, and Knight Rider models a look too. Just be sure to use our code variant with the link in the description below so they know we sent you. Okay, unfortunately when BVS Dawn of Justice came out in 2016, the reaction was very split as it is to this day. You have your diehard Snyder fans who will defend it till the end of time and then you basically have everyone else who was like, yeah, very much lackluster, huge missed opportunity, just not cohesive or great as a film. The movie was also torn apart by critics having a 29% Rotten Tomato score. As for me, I've been very vocal. I think BVS has a lot of cool parts and Batman and Superman look great. The Batmobile is awesome, the fights are awesome, but the Lex Luthor storyline was not the best to say the least. Don't get me wrong, the idea of an older Batman finding out there's an alien living on Earth that could take over the planet if he wanted and growing so paranoid that he tries to take him out before he could potentially turn on us is cool, but at the same time giving us this older Batman, a Batman who's never heard of Superman or any of the other DC characters was one of the biggest mistakes for this movie and the greater DCEU. Because we got a Batman where most of his career already happened, so they would just allude to things from the past like the death of one of the Robins at the hands of the Joker. Then Zack Snyder would later confirm that the Robin killed was Dick Grayson when many of us thought it was Jason Todd as that's the Robin Joker killed in the comics. But instead Snyder made it Grayson for why? I do not know. Anyway, I see what Zack Snyder and DC were trying to do by giving us an older Batman saying this world is already established with heroes, but I think it still misses the mark. They were basically trying to play catch up with the MCU at this point as they were already on their second Avengers movie a year prior to BVS. The problem is rushing anything rarely ever works, especially in storytelling because you have to give the audience time to build a connection with the characters. Yes, they're familiar characters, but different interpretations of them. Case in point, Ben Affleck Batman was a Batman that did not mind killing. He was mowing people down left and right in his Batmobile, blowing people up. It was crazy. Don't get me wrong, Keaton Batman did his fair share of killing and is the OG badass Batman. But remember, we were coming off Christian Bale Batman. So at this point, the current generation was all like, Batman doesn't kill. He's got one rule, so it threw everyone for a loop. But going back to rushing things, how were you gonna introduce Doomsday as the villain that literally killed Superman in the comic books and then have him kill Superman in the Man of Steel's second appearance in your extended universe? That would literally be the equivalent of introducing Thanos in the second ever MCU film and killing him and Iron Man off in that same film. You just don't do that because it literally makes no sense. Again, the fact that they decided to introduce Doomsday as the big bad for BVS still boggles my mind to this day. And that they decided to kill Superman off in his second ever appearance in the DCEU blows my ever loving mind. I love Superman a lot. He's one of my favorite characters of all time. And even I wasn't emotionally invested enough to care that much when they killed him off in BVS. I was just like, why are you doing this so early? We didn't have nearly enough time with Henry Cavill Superman for that death to me something yet, and that's coming from someone who loves Henry Cavill Superman. The movie ended up making $873.6 million off its $225 million budget, but it really should have been a billion dollar plus film. We're talking about the first ever live action Batman Superman movie released at the height of comic book movies. Again, for me, the biggest problem with this film is the fact that it was rushed, and they introduced a character like Doomsday way too early. They should have held off for several films like they did with Thanos, then killed Superman, at which point Point, we would have all been heartbroken, as we would have been invested several films in at that point. All for him to inevitably come back to life and face someone like Darkseid. Another amazing villain they did introduce, just also way too soon. And that's all on top of getting the worst version of Lex Luthor I've ever seen. The introduction of Wonder Woman was great though, she's a demigod and has been around forever, so that made sense. And again, Ben Affleck Batman looked great and was badass, but the story and choices that were made overall set the DCEU down a horrible path. Case in point, Later that year, in August of 2016, we got Suicide Squad, directed by David Ayer. It is widely considered to be one of, if not the worst entry into the DC Extended Universe. And with that said, I personally don't hate this film as much as most, but I could definitely see why it's crapped on so much. I mean, first and foremost, we got an awful take on this universe's Joker as played by Jared Leto. Now, Leto is a fantastic Oscar-winning actor and his band 30 Seconds to Mars is great. However, just because you're a great actor musician doesn't mean everything you do is going to be hailed as golden and that's the case here. His take on the Joker is widely considered one of the worst interpretations of the character. From the moment we got that Joker teaser image of him with the damaged tattoo on his forehead and shiny metal grill, fans became very worried and rightfully so because again, not the 
best. He also played Morbius in Sony's Morbius film, which is regarded as one of the worst comic book films of all time. So basically what I'm saying is maybe he should stay away from comic book movies. So you mix Leto's Joker in with the horrible interpretation of Killer Croc, who's one of the best Batman villains, and you end up with an overall lackluster story and one of the most widely hated DCEU films to date. Having said that, it did give us a couple of awesome characters, like Margot Robbie's Harley Quinn, who has become one of the best parts of this universe. Viola Davis, Amanda Waller, yet again awesome. Jai Courtney as Captain Boomerang, totally awesome. Will Smith as Deadshot, and a banger soundtrack. We also got a dope cameo from Ben Affleck Batman. The crazy thing is, this movie didn't even do bad at the box office. It had a budget of roughly $175 million, and it made $746 million worldwide, so it wasn't even a flop. It actually made a tidy profit for the studio, yet it's still regarded amongst fans as one of the worst offerings from this universe. This film also has one of the biggest continuity errors in the DCEU, when The Flash briefly makes a cameo defeating Captain Boomerang. Because in the Justice League movie, he says he's never done battle. It's just something that's always annoyed me. But next up, we have Wonder Woman, which came out in 2017. Now, I don't have a damn bad thing to say about this movie. This is actually one of my favorite superhero films of all time, and certainly my favorite DCEU film of all time. I absolutely adore this movie. I think the rest of the DCEU should have been along the lines of this. I love the way they portrayed Wonder Woman as a character and hero. I've been saying it ever since this film was released, but my favorite part about this movie is the fact that nothing else matters to Wonder Woman besides doing the right thing. Remember that scene in the trenches where Steve Trevor and the other soldiers were like, no, we can't go into battle. It's too risky. But she's like, what are you talking about? No, we fight for the innocent, no matter the cost. She was a hero through and through. It also had some of the best fight scenes. The battle with Ares at the end was dope. Wonder Woman was just a complete and utter badass. Again, I don't have anything bad to say about this movie. Gal Gadot and director Patty Jenkins nailed it, and apparently critics agree, as it's got a 93% on Rotten Tomatoes, the critics' highest rated DCEU film, and that's for a good reason. Story, action, dialogue, cinematography, all good. I just said it, but again, I have not a bad thing to say about this movie. And it killed at the box office. It only had a budget of 149 million, which is not a lot for comic book movies these days, and it ended up making 822 million worldwide. This gave me hope for the DCEU again, but then we got the Justice League movie later that year in November of 2017, where things got really dicey. Now, Justice League was originally directed and halfway shot by Zack Snyder. And as I said earlier, he was essentially helming the DCEU at this point. However, during production, he tragically lost his daughter, which obviously meant he had to leave the film. And Warner Brothers in DC having so much weighing on this Justice League movie for the future of their DC cinematic universe, were like, we need an A-list director to come in and finish this film. Someone who is really good with superhero team movies. So who did they tap? Marvel Studios director Joss Whedon, who directed the first two Avengers films. Yeah, they had to be thinking, you know what's gonna make this film successful and be more like the MCU? The guy who did the first two Avengers films. That will guarantee this film is gonna be great. With Snyder out of the picture, Joss Whedon came in and essentially redid the entire film, changing the tone, reshooting a lot of the same scenes, trying to give it more of that colorful MCU tone, and so on and so forth. A total departure from when Zack Snyder wrote and had already shot before Whedon came on board. But you know the executives at Warner Brothers in DC were like, yeah, yeah, do that. It's working for Marvel. And though we haven't really been losing money on any of our previous films, the fan reaction has been very mixed with our movies and we're not making as much as we would like. So yeah, marvel fi this Justice League movie because that's gonna get butts in seats. So that's exactly what they did. And it gave us one of the worst films in this universe. Being frank, this film is pretty bad. Across the board, I can't really think of that many redeeming qualities, and critics and fans all alike agree. It's got a 39% critic score on Rotten Tomatoes. I remember initially seeing it, wanting to like this film so bad, and even tricking myself into liking it a little bit because it was the first Justice League movie. It was everything I've ever waited for, but at the end of the day, not great. The film costs upwards of 300 million to make without marketing and only made 660 million worldwide. So though it technically didn't lose any money, it didn't really make much either. At the same time, Warner Brothers and DC were banking on this movie to potentially be their biggest film ever. We're talking about the first Justice League. The first time we're seeing Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, Flash, Aquaman, and Cyborg together in live action. This should have been a billion plus movie all day long, but it didn't even come close. The dialogue they gave Batman with him trying to make goofy jokes all the way to the CGI of Superman's lips 
Just again, no. What makes this movie an even bigger tragedy is seeing the Snyder Cut several years later, but more on that in a bit. At this point, there were only five movies into the DCEU, and they were already struggling. All very hit or miss, as they couldn't get fans to attach to these films like they were attaching to the MCU. Let's look at the facts. Man of Steel, BVS, Suicide Squad, Wonder Woman, and Justice League. The only two films out of those five that people, for the most part, would agree were good would be Man of Steel and Wonder Woman. So three out of the first five films split the audience right down the middle. And honestly, looking back at it now, several years later, the DCEU suffered from a lack of cohesiveness. They all kind of just felt like one-offs that were forced to live in the same world. It was very apparent early on that although Zack Snyder had a plan on where he wanted to take and build out these characters, Warner Brothers also wanted to try other things, so it just felt all disjointed. However, before Justice League did poorly at the box office, we were supposed to get a second Justice League film from Snyder. Snyder explained that Darkseid would have come to Earth, Lex would have found the Anti-Life Equation, and teamed up with the Riddler, who would have been able to decipher it. Lex would then suggest to Darkseid, if you kill Lois Lane, who would have been pregnant at this point in time, you'll be able to control Superman as he will succumb to the Anti-Life Equation, as the Anti-Life Equation allows you to control all will in the universe. Darkseid would have indeed ended up killing pregnant Lois, at which point he would be able to control Superman with the Anti-Life Equation, giving us the Nightmareverse, which is why we saw that nightmare sequence of the future in BVS, and also saw Flash from the future warn Bruce in the Batcave saying, Lois, she's the key. Because if they were able to save Lois, Superman would not go evil or been controlled by Darkseid. So in this Justice League 2 that was never made, future Bruce, knowing how Superman would go evil, would sacrifice himself to save Lois, at which point Superman would never turn evil, and he would team up with the Atlanteans and the Amazons to defeat Darkseid, and his new gods. So they would have ended up killing off Batman in the end. Now, although that sounds really cool and I would have liked to see that, it's still an Elseworlds type story because you can't permanently kill off a character like Batman so early. Killing him off in the second Justice League film gives you no longevity for your DC universe. So I don't even think Snyder's version would have been the answer to success to the DC movie universe. Remember, as brilliant as Snyder is, he also gave us BVS, which wasn't that great. So after Warner and DC gambled everything on Justice League and somehow it performed worse than BVS, Snyder and Warner parted ways. With that said, you can't blame the theatrical cut of Justice League on Snyder as Joss Whedon and the studio butchered that thing, giving us a Frankenstein monster version of what was originally intended. The DCEU would then go quiet for a year until December 2018 rolled around when we got Aquaman directed by James Wan. This is where things get even stranger for DC because after the tragedy that was the Justice League film, which should have been DC's biggest film and one of Warner Brothers' biggest films in general, they found massive success with Aquaman making $1.1 billion at the global box office off a $160 million budget. Meaning clearly, for the most part, fans liked the film. I thought it was a ton of fun, it had its problems, but overall it was entertaining. But no matter how you feel about this film, it still remains the DCEU's most successful movie. Just think about that. An Aquaman film! outperformed a Batman vs. Superman movie and a Justice League movie. I mean, Justice League movie. I don't... I don't know, guys. At this point, DC fans want to believe we've rebounded, especially since in April of 2019, they had another hit with Shazam one of their best entries. Now, this film didn't make that much worldwide coming in at 367 million off a $100 million budget, but it also didn't lose any money and it was very well received by fans overall. So at this point, the DCEU had two back-to-back -back wins. But even with that, the DCEU was still lacking a plan, a vision going forward. The universe still felt like it didn't know where it was going. It was just throwing out stuff with no real path of where this was gonna lead in the end. This is something the first 10 years of Marvel nailed with their end credit scenes by tying every film together and teasing the threat of Thanos inevitably coming. But it was very clear that the DCEU strategy was set on fire a long time ago, as Zack Snyder's original plan, which would have concluded in Justice League Part 2 that we just went over, ended up being very short-lived as the Justice League bombed and threw it all into chaos. Then DC and Warner just started throwing stuff out there, hoping it stuck, which would be its downfall. To be fair, it did seem like they had somewhat of a plan before panicking after BVS and Justice 
Justice League's polarizing performances. Because on top of Justice League Part 2, we were supposed to get a solo cyborg film, a Green Lantern Corps movie, a Nightwing film, a Ben Affleck Batman film with Deathstroke as the villain, a Harley Quinn vs. Joker movie, a New Gods film, and of course, Man of Steel 2 amongst others, which was another big problem the DCEU had. They would announce all these films that we were supposed to get or that were currently in development and then never follow through for some strange reason. How are you gonna say we're doing a solo Nightwing movie then never follow through. The fact that DC announced so many of these films that we never got just pissed the fandom off and left a bad taste in our mouths, which no doubt contributed to the growing disdain fans felt towards the DCEU. I haven't even gotten to the bit where the DCEU would literally shoot an entire film, be like, oh my God, this isn't good. We can't release it. It will really only make things worse. Anyway, after 2019 Shazam and DC still not having a solid plan, in February of 2020, they gave us Birds of Prey, starring Margot Robbie as Harley Quinn, introducing the Birds of Prey team with Black Canary and Huntress. But even the amazing Margot Robbie and her portrayal of Harley Quinn couldn't save this film. It was just an absolute mess. Everything from the story to the portrayal of the characters were not good. Don't even get me started on Cassandra Cain, who's supposed to be one of the most badass assassins and deadly members of the Bat family. And then you also had Black Mask as the villain, one of the coolest Batman villains played by the amazing Ewan McGregor, but somehow that got messed up too. For the sake of not going down the rabbit hole, let's just say audiences widely agreed this film was not a winner. It cost around $84 million to make without marketing and only made $205 million worldwide, being one of the biggest flops for the DCEU to this day. Again, even Margot Robbie couldn't save this film, which is annoying as I'm a big fan of Birds of Prey in the comics, and this could have been great. However, this was not the only film we got in the year of 2020. We would also get Wonder Woman 1980. 84, which was highly anticipated coming off an extremely successful first Wonder Woman film. But guess what? This was not that. Somehow they went from the first Wonder Woman film, which is my favorite DCEU movie and widely viewed as one of the best films in this universe, to Wonder Woman 1984, one of the worst films they've put out. It's just mind boggling to me that you can go from a masterpiece to this. The film also didn't really have Wonder Woman that much. It was mostly about Diana and Steve Trevor. Also, both villains on paper should have been great, but they didn't land. Maxwell Lord played by the amazing Pedro Pascal and Cheetah played by Kristen Wiig. The story and character development just wasn't there. And it pains me to say that as this film should have been an amazing movie as the first one was so good. I still love Gal Gadot Wonder Woman. It's just a Again, the script. <sighs> And I'm not gonna judge the box office numbers on this as this movie was released via streaming during the height of lockdown, but let's be honest, even though it was released in theaters, you can't really judge it given the time period. Then in 2021, we got the Snyder Cut of the Justice League. This was something that fans were petitioning for ever since the disaster that was the 2017 Whedon Theatrical Justice League. The fandom pushed so much that Warner Brothers brought back Zack Snyder and gave him an additional $70 million to finish the Justice League, how he would have done it without the studio having any input. Hence the Snyder Cut, which was released on March 18th of 2021, exclusively on HBO Max, now Max. And I'm thrilled to say this movie is leaps and bounds better than the theatrical version we got. It's also four hours long. It's a Lord of the Rings type epic. It's easily one of the best films the DCU has done. I might even say the best, though it's not considered canon to the DC Extended Universe. Warner Brothers still considers the theatrical version as canon. I don't know why, but hey, suit are gonna suit. Now with that said, and this being one of my personal favorites, I still think if this was the version we got in the first place, it still wouldn't have helped the DC Extended Universe out all that much. Sure, it was a way better film, but the path Snyder put all of his DC characters on had no longevity. Dude was looking to kill off Batman in the second Justice League movie. How do you kill off Batman so early when you're building a universe that needs to last years? I've always said it, but Snyder's plan for the DC Universe always worked better as an Elseworld story. And now all the Snyder diehards are like, you're crazy. Easy, you're stupid, go away, I don't like your face. All I'm saying is the way Zack Snyder saw the characters, wrote them, and wanted to write them always worked better for an alternate version storyline. He liked to stray away a lot from the characters' core values and wanted to do stuff that just wouldn't make sense if you were trying to build out a long-lasting, healthy, shared, 
DC Universe. Again, he had a lot of cool ideas. The Snyder Cut was great, but it doesn't work if you're trying to compete with someone like Marvel Studios. So giving us the Snyder Cut was probably the best and worst thing Warner Brothers could have done because people overwhelmingly liked it, but now it reminded the fandom what could have been. We could have seen Superman turn evil, Batman sacrifice himself to save Lois, and all the like. We apparently also would have got the flashback of when the Joker killed Robin, and so on and so forth. I mean, we saw the Snyder Cut ended with Batman in the Nightmare Future teaming up with the Joker, Deathstroke, and more to take down Superman. I want to see that. That said, I don't think if Snyder was allowed to continue, it would have saved the DCEU. But it certainly would have been better than what we got, and we probably would have got a few extra DCEU films out of it. Anyway, after this, we would get James Gunn's The Suicide Squad in 2021, which was fantastic. It's one of my favorite entries into this universe, and the movie got him the gig to become the new co-mastermind of the DCU. This was another movie that was digitally released on HBO Max because movie theaters were not fully reopened yet due to the event that shall not be named. But it was another solid entry into this universe. While The Suicide Squad is a sequel to Suicide Squad, it kind of acknowledged that but also ignored the first film for the most part, and fans dug it. We got Margot Robbie's best performance as Harley Quinn, Idris Elba as Bloodsport, who was great, and John Cena as Peacemaker, which was incredible. And we can't forget King Shark, who was voiced by the amazing Sylvester Stallone. The cast of characters were really good. The movie was just good all the way around, but yet again, it didn't really do anything to build out this universe. It's kind of like, why are all these films connected if we're not leading to something? Anyway, after this, we would get a Peacemaker spinoff series on HBO Max with John Cena reprising his role as Peacemaker. This for me, is the best thing the DCU has done, and it's a TV show. And I know I'm not alone. This show was a massive hit. The intro alone went viral. It's also the only TV show that connects to this universe. John Cena was born for this role. He nailed it. It's funny, the action's great, the writing, all of it, I just love it. The DCU gave us this awesome series, and I would say it did more for expanding the DC universe than any film with the numerous amount of mentions of other DC characters, obscure and known alike. Hell, in the season finale, we got the entire Justice League with Ezra Miller Flash and Jason Momoa Aquaman actually making cameos. But at this point, too many people have been jumping ship from the DCEU for several films now as it was a constant up and down battle and nothing was going anywhere. Now it was also around this time that the CEO of Warner Brothers, David Zaslav, decided to scrap the solo Batgirl movie that just wrapped production. Word on the street was it was not great so rather than release it and further tarnish the DC brand with another flop, they just ate the money and took it as a tax write-off. I don't know if you remember but Michael Keaton was supposed to reprise his role as Batman in this Batgirl movie and apparently reset things as the new Batman. Since Ben Affleck Batman was out at this point in time due to all the drama with the Justice League and Zack Snyder. But the thing is, J.K. Simmons was reprising his role as Jim Gordon, who was the same commissioner for Ben Affleck Batman, so I guess the multiverse would have explained this somehow? I don't know. It's just irritating that between the Batgirl debacle and The Flash being one of the biggest box office flops ever, DC totally wasted bringing Michael Keaton back as Batman. It's just a wasted opportunity. Don't get me wrong, he was great in The Flash, but his return should have been way more triumphant and long-lasting. At this point, the DCEU was in such trouble they were willing to cancel a film that had already been shot when they didn't think it was going to perform well. That says so much. After this, DC would give us the Batman in March of 2022, which was decidedly not part of the official DCEU, like 2019's Joker, but it's Batman and the Joker during the height of the DCEU, so an honorable nod to both. While we're not going to see these characters battling alongside Gal Gadot anytime soon, these movies had a lot of love from fans, with the Batman garnering an 87% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes, and both raking in around a billion dollars each. Shifting back to the official canon, we got Black Adam in 2022. The the only DCU film we would get that year. And this film had a lot resting on its success. The Rock promised this to be like the new age of the DC film universe. The hierarchy of power was about to change as he so often quoted. But DC saw that even with a massive marketing push by the biggest star on the planet, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, it just wasn't tracking well. So with projections not looking so great around a week before the release of the film, The Rock decided to spoil on The Tonight Show that Henry Cavill's Superman would be returned in this film, alluding that in a Black Adam part two or somewhere down the line, we would get a Black Adam versus Superman movie. All of this was a last ditch effort to get butts in seats. But guess what? It didn't get that many butts in seats. The film cost around 200 million and only brought in 
393 million worldwide. The film wasn't bad, but it also wasn't great, at least in my personal opinion. But no matter how you feel about the film, it wasn't enough to get people to care and come see the film, even with the end scene of Henry Cavill Superman arriving to face Black Adam. Bringing Cavill back and pitting him up against The Rock's Black Adam was a last ditch effort to save the DC Extended Universe, but it did not work. And after this effort failed, Warner Brothers made a dramatic shift and announced that James Gunn and Peter Safran would be taking over the creative reins of DC Comics, film, animation, and video games. And James Gunn and Peter Safran saw fit to effectively end the DC Extended Universe. Going so far to have a meeting with Henry Cavill telling him he will not be Superman going forward. And that's right after Cavill literally just reprised his role as the character at the end of Black Adam and took to his Instagram to tell the world he would be Superman once again, giving us the character in a way we've always wanted to see him. Man, do I feel horrible for Cavill. Literally just months after making that announcement and appearing in Black Adam, it was taken away from him, which is absolutely horrible. I love Cavill and thought he was a good Superman. He just needed good writing, which apparently we were gonna get! In any case, this is the point where the DCEU effectively was given an expiration date, as there were only four more films in the pipeline that had started production before James Gunn and Peter Safran came aboard. Shazam! Fury of the Gods, The Flash, Blue Beetle, and Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom. James Gunn then went on to make a video telling all of us what he has in store for the DCEU, which is now simply being called the DC Universe, instead of the DC Extended Universe, aka the DCU. Now at this point, the DCEU films started bombing at the box office because effectively they did not matter anymore. It was not going anywhere. With that said, the next one up was Shazam! Fury of the Gods. The movie wasn't very good, which was a shock, as the first one was actually pretty solid. This was a huge disappointment, even if it wasn't going anywhere. Even though it had a cameo of Wonder Woman and T Shazam joining the JSA, which was just introduced to us in Black Adam, it didn't work. This added to the confusion as again, at this point, the DC Extended Universe was essentially over, although they were alluding that some things from this universe would fold over into the new DCU. We're just not sure how that continuity will line up. In any case, the film was not good. Then we had The Flash, which I enjoyed mainly because of Michael Keaton Batman, but it became one of the biggest superhero flops of all time until it was seemingly beaten out by the Marvels. Then after that, we got Blue Beetle, which was great in my opinion. It's my second favorite DCEU film, but alas, everyone checked out at this point because the DC Extended Universe, again, was effectively over, and we're now waiting for the start of the DCU with Superman Legacy in 2025. Hopefully it sparks the beginning of something great for the DC live action film universe. And that leads us to Aquaman and the Lost Kingdom, which probably won't perform well at the box office either, whether it's good or not, because again, it holds no consequence going forward and fans have little interest left. Jason Momoa has also heavily implied that he will still be in James Gunn's DCU, but rumor has it as a brand new character, this time around potentially Lobo, which is a way better fit for him and would be absolutely fantastic. Quite honestly, if done right, it could, it could rival Ryan Reynolds' Deadpool. Okay, and maybe, like maybe. In the end, Zack Snyder's vision for the DCEU was dismantled and undone by a few things. But the biggest killer, in our opinion, was that they tried to do too much too fast and didn't give enough time to establish each character and lock the audience in for the bigger moments. So when something didn't land well, it had a much bigger effect overall. Then you lump on the heartbreaking loss of Zack Snyder's daughter, which led to him stepping away from Justice League while it was in production and the resulting disaster that film turned into. And we were left with a cascading effect of negative reaction from fans and increasingly lower box office results. And when a studio starts losing money, they tend to make awful creative decisions out of panic and desperation. It's never a good recipe and somewhat ironic seems to be the tailspin Marvel and the MCU finds itself in right now. But that's a story for another day. Ultimately, the rise and fall of the DCEU is a cautionary tale for franchise builders, and one that we seriously hope James Gunn, Peter Safran, and the new heads of Warner Brothers learn from. The DC Extended Universe film franchise had a few good films, characters, and portrayals, but overall they just could never find their footing and make it work cohesively. And now we wait for the start of James Gunn's DCU with Creature Commandos in 2024 and Superman 
Superman Legacy in 2025. Let me tell you, a lot is riding on Superman Legacy because fans are already discouraged by the state of the superhero genre. So there might not be any coming back for the DC live action film universe for a very long time if Superman Legacy does not stick the landing. Having said that, we have faith that Gunn is going to deliver. He is a very capable and proven writer-director, giving us some of the best superhero movies and shows we've gotten in a long time, including Guardians of the Galaxy, The Suicide Squad, and Peacemaker. Not to mention, the cast announcements he's made so far look very promising, so we're gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. But what do you guys think about the rise and fall of the DC Extended Universe, and what do you think most led to its demise? Let us know down in the comments. Otherwise, we'll see you next time when we talk about the Superman-Godzilla rematch.